Hello, and welcome to this webinar from Science, Science Signaling, and AAAS. My name is Annalisa Van Hook, and I'm the web editor at Science Signaling. In today's webinar, we'll be discussing how rewiring of signaling pathways contributes to drug resistance in tumors. This webinar is the first in a series focusing on the signaling pathways that allow cancer development and progression, the emerging research in identifying and targeting these pathways, and innovations in developing cancer treatment options. Recent advances in our understanding of cancer have revealed that the disease cannot be understood simply through analysis of the genetic mutations within the cancer cells. Instead, tumors should be considered complex tissues in which the cancer cells evolve and communicate with the surrounding microenvironment to promote their own survival and dissemination. Although therapies that target specific signaling proteins or pathways have been remarkably successful at treating certain cancers, the tumors, the tumors frequently develop resistance, leading to even more aggressive forms of the disease. This webinar will focus on how rewiring of signaling pathways in response to drug treatment contributes to resistance and how this knowledge can be leveraged to develop more effective treatment strategies. It's my great pleasure to introduce our guest speakers for this webinar. They're Dr. They're Dr. Michael Yaffe from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Dr. Jeffrey Engelman from Harvard Medical School, and Dr. Michael Deininger from the University of Utah. A very warm welcome to you all, and thank you for being on the line with us. Before we start today's webinar, I have some information that our audience might find helpful. Up to the right of your screen, you'll see each of our speakers. Click on the View Bio link to see more details about each speaker. Under the Slideshow window is the Resources tab, where you can find additional information about technologies related to, to today's discussion and the link to download a PDF of the slides. Our speakers will give short presentations, after which we'll have a Q&A session in which they'll address some of the questions submitted by you, our live online viewers. So if you're joining us live, start thinking about some questions and submit them at any time by clicking the Ask a Question button below the slide window. Type your question into the message box and then click OK. Please remember to keep your questions as short and clear as possible, as that will give them the best chance of being put to our panelists. You can also log into your Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn accounts during the webinar to post updates or send tweets about the event. Just click on the relevant widgets at the top of the screen. For tweets, you can add the hashtag #ScienceWebinar. Finally, thank you to Cell Signaling Technologies and the Koch Institute for their sponsorship of today's webinar. Now I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Michael Yaffe. Dr. Yaffe is the David H. Koch Professor of Biology and Biological Engineering at the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He's Senior Associate Member of the Broad Institute, of the Broad Institute and an attending surgeon in the departments of surgery and anesthesia at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center of Harvard Medical School. Dr. Yaffe is also the chief scientific editor of Science Signaling. Dr. Yaffe's research focuses on the complex signaling pathways that cells use to respond to DNA damage and inflammation, particularly the role of protein kinases and, and modular binding domains in tumor development and anti-cancer therapeutics. Welcome, Dr. Yaffe. Thank you, Dr. Van Hook. It's a great pleasure to be here. What I would like to spend the next 10 minutes or so telling you about is the connection between signaling pathways and the DNA damage response and how we can leverage this therapeutically. In this slide, you see in the upper left-hand corner a tumor being surgically excised, and then the standard mechanisms by which we treat tumors shown in the lower right-hand panel, which are either chemotherapy or radiation. And what I would like to tell you about is how we can hopefully use a more detailed molecular understanding of signaling networks and protein kinases and tyrosine kinases and growth factor receptors to manipulate the DNA damage response to get more favorable outcomes. And the process that I want to tell you about is called dynamic rewiring. Now, in order to explain dynamic rewiring, I first have to make a, a pitch for systems biology and tell you that the missing data in cancer at the moment that connects the genotype to the phenotype is really the signaling events. 
We have a very good understanding, as shown in this slide, of the genetic mutations that are present in many tumor types. And we have a pretty good understanding, again, for many tumor types or cell lines, of the gene expression profiles. But the missing piece here is shown in the upper center of the slide, and that's the activation state of the signaling pathways and the protein expression levels that we can determine through proteomics. Now, what I want to make the argument for is why systems biology of signaling, a study of these signaling networks and pathways is likely to be so essential. And that's because first let me remind you that targeted monotherapies for cancer, including all of the hot EGF receptor inhibitors and BRAF inhibitors and ALK inhibitors, they all work fantastically, but the duration of response is short. And that's because all patients eventually develop resistance. The second point I want to make is something which is not intuitive, and that's that most forms of combination chemotherapy actually aren't synergistic. They work because the toxicities of the therapies are not overlapping, but they don't directly take advantage of, systematic, of a systematic connection between the different therapies that are adopted. And I would argue that system biology is the way to identify the new pathways that we want to target in combination, as well as to identify both new drugs and new biomarkers of response. The concept that I really want to focus on, shown at the bottom of the slide, is the idea of dynamic network rewiring. And you've probably heard about dynamic network rewiring in the context of molecular therapies alone. And in this rather famous example uh, published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology in 2011, you can see a patient with metastatic melanoma who has an absolutely dramatic response to a BRAF inhibitor at 15 weeks. But eight weeks later, shown in, the, in, the, in panel C, you can see the tumors have essentially all recurred. And as shown in panel D, that's because the network, which was so effectively inhibited, has now rewired itself to reactivate the, the, B, the, the MAP kinase pathway. Now, what I want to tell you, though, is that although dynamic network rewiring may be bad for molecularly targeted therapies alone, it can be used therapeutically for combination chemotherapy in order to increase our ability to use targeted therapies in combination with conventional DNA damaging chemotherapies to improve cancer treatment. Now, let me remind you that although targeted therapies are now all the rage, the vast majority of patients who are cured of cancer, and that's shown uh, in the scale slide where you see many patients on one side and one patient on the other, the vast majority of patients who today have been treated with, uh, who today have been cured of cancer have been cured by conventional DNA damaging chemotherapy. And Mike Lee, shown on the right side of, uh, side of the slide in my lab, took an interest in trying to understand how we could leverage targeted therapies with conventional DNA damaging chemotherapies. And he focused primarily on triple negative breast cancers. These comprise about 20% of all breast tumors, and they're called triple negative because they don't show expression of the estrogen or progesterone receptor, and they don't overexpress the EGFR family members HER2. Although many of them, but not all, do overexpress to some degree the EGF receptor. And what Mike set out to do was to do a combinatorial drug screen in which we use DNA damaging agents shown uh, illustrated in, in blue on the left-hand half together with specific inhibitors of signaling pathways. And what made this story unique was rather than give the two drugs simultaneously, we asked what would happen if we gave one drug and allowed this dynamic network rewiring to occur before we gave the second drug. And the story I'll tell you about deals with doxorubicin and erlotinib, erlotinib being an EGFR receptor uh, antagonist. Both of these drugs, importantly, are currently in the clinic, and they're used for the treatment of triple negative breast cancer. Now, on, the, on this slide, what I'm showing you is the percent of apoptosis that you see eight hours after you treat triple negative breast cancer cells with doxorubicin alone, the number is about 15%, or erlotinib alone after 36 hours, about 15%, or if you combine these drugs. And if you combine these drugs, what you see is you get about 15%. Not much happens. But if you give the erlotinib and you wait somewhere between 4 and 48 hours, you can see in the red bars, you can increase the killing by up to 500%. If you reverse the order, that's shown in the very uh, last two gray bars, you can see that if you reverse the order there, all that happens in this case is that you decrease the effectiveness of doxorubicin uh, compared to doxorubicin in the absence of erlotinib. Now, this 
the mechanism that underlies this first is unique to triple negative breast cancer cells. If you look at, you, you should see on your slide now four, four sets of graphs and the one in the top that says BT20, TNBC, this shows you the synergy which you can demonstrate by a bliss or child tulele analysis for the erlotinib followed by doxorubicin. That's the black bar labeled E arrow D. I'd like you to notice just to the right of that, if we take MDA, MB453 cells, those are the HER2 overexpressing cells, and we pretreat those with erlotinib, in fact, the cells become resistant to doxorubicin, even less effective than doxorubicin alone. And in the bottom two panels, I'm showing you the luminal breast cancer cells, that is, those that express estrogen and progesterone receptors, or a cell line annotated as normal breast, really have only minimal increase or no increase if you pretreat with erlotinib. So this time-dependent increase in the ability to sensitize breast cancer cells to doxorubicin seems to be unique to triple negative breast cancer cells. Now, what's the underlying mechanism for this? And in order to figure this out, we did a variety of different experiments. We used gene expression profiling, and we measured as many uh, of the signaling proteins in the, act, in the pathways that we could measure, and then and as many of the responses as we could, and we used data-driven modeling to come up with a mechanism that explained what happened. And to sum up a lot of work very quickly, what we found were several things. First, it appeared that the dynamic network rewiring functioned by turning on an apoptotic pathway that was otherwise masked, and in addition, it appeared that we could identify a biomarker of this response, and the biomarker of that response turned out to be the activation of caspase-8, our ability to cleave caspase-8. So if we look here uh, at the rank order of 10 different triple negative breast cancer cell lines for their ability to activate this mechanism and show synergy with respect to, to pretreatment with erlotinib, what I'm hoping this slide shows you is that the top four cell lines, the one that had the most dramatic response, in fact, were not the ones that overexpressed the EGF receptor. They were the ones that had the highest basal level of the phospho-EGFR. And these were the same ones that had activated caspase 8 when we pretreated them with our laudanum. So to sum up all of this work very quickly, what, what I'm showing you here is that on the left-hand side, in the absence of erlotinib treatment, DNA damage can only kill these cells by acting through a caspase-9 and caspase-3 dependent pathway. But if you pretreat the cells with erlotinib, shown in this red highlighted box, you wean them off of their addiction to the EGF receptor, and you now unmask a second death pathway that goes through caspase-8 and caspase-9 to increase the ability of doxorubicin to kill these cells. Now, importantly, this doesn't just work in vitro, it also works in vivo. I'm showing you here in the top line, the black line with the black squares, that if you give these mice tumors and you treat them with DMSO alone, the tumor grows and grows. If you treat them with doxorubicin alone, that's the green line, you get a transient response. And if you treat them with doxorubicin and a lot of them together, you get a, uh, you get a slightly better response, but the tumor recurs. The red diamonds show what happens in this xenograph model. When you treat the tumors with erlotinib, and then 24 hours later you give these mice a single dose of doxorubicin, and at least over the time course of this experiment, there was no further increase in tumor growth. Now, could you use this approach as a mechanism to sensitize tumor cells uh, using a therapeutic that could automatically deliver to the tumor a pulse dose of erlotinib followed by sustained release of doxorubicin. And so we teamed up with Paula Hammond, a chemical engineer shown here on the right half of the slide, in order to experiment with this. And we came up with a very nice system to do this. We, in fact, came up with a mechanism where we had multi-layer liposomes, the outside of which contained only erlotinib, shown in the lower left, and the inner core of which contained doxorubicin and erlotinib, shown in the lower right. And with this approach, I hope you can see in this graph that we got early release of erlotinib, that's the blue curve, and later sustained release of doxorubicin, that's the red curve. So we had a therapeutic drug that would both target to tumors, I'll explain that in a moment, and would give us early release of erlotinib and then delayed release of doxorubicin. Now, what I hope you see in this slide is to target these to the tumor, we did a few things. We, cut, we coated them uh, with polyethylene glycol uh, in order to prevent dramatic uptake by the liver, and then we added a coating of folate so that we could take advantage of the need of tumor cells for high levels of folate. And in fact, these, uh, these 
particles work wonderfully at targeting tumors. In the lo what you should see here are three panels of mice, and the lowest most panel says BT20 no treatment, and that shows you these tumor xenographs growing in these new in the flanks of these nude mice. If we treat these tumors with a multi-layered liposome that only contains doxorubicin, that's the middle panel. That's the equivalent of treating these uh, tumors with the clinically used drug doxel. You can see there's very minimal response. However, if we treat these tumors in these nude mice with our combination therapeutic, it gives the early release of erlotinib followed by the delayed release of doxorubicin. That's the top panel. And you can see that only under this condition do we see the tumors actually regress in size. And if we quantify this, I'd like you to notice that it's only the blue circles on this plot, where on the y-axis we're plotting the signal strength of the tumor on a log scale. It's only the time-staggered therapeutic that gives us this pronounced decrease uh, in tumor size for triple negative breast tumors. Importantly, now shown on the left-hand half of your slide, is that it also works in a subset of non-small cell lung cancers. These are A549 cells grown in these nude mouse xenographs. And if you just look at what you can see in the lower left aspect of the mice and the upper, uh, and the upper aspect, I'd like you to notice that if we don't treat the mice, the tumors grow. And if we use our time-staggered therapeutic, the tumors shrink. And that's, again, shown by the, cur the blue curve in the graph labeled A549. It's only the time-staggered therapeutic that gives us the dramatic decrease in tumor size. Now, we published this in a fantastic journal. I'd encourage all of our listeners to submit your very best signaling research to science signaling. And so this raised the question then of whether this type of time-staggered inhibition where you would block a particular receptor tyrosine kinase and then you would treat with a DNA damaging drug, was this unique to triple negative breast cancer? And the top slide, the green panel shows you what I've shown you before, which is in triple negative breast cancer cells, if you look only at that black bar, you can see time staggered inhibition of the EGF receptor works wonderfully. However, I hope you'll recall that I showed you that if you had HER2 overexpressing cells, and that's shown in the left half of your slide in the pink bars, that the time-staggered effect of erlotinib actually was to decrease the sensitivity to doxorubicin. And we reasoned that maybe that's because there's these HER2 overexpressing cells, rather than being addicted to the EGF receptor, were addicted to HER2. And so we asked what would happen if we treated those cells with lapatinib, a drug that blocks HER2 and the EGF receptor. And if you look just at the pink box on the right-hand half of your screen, I'll try to put a cursor there, I would like you to notice that only under those conditions did we find a dramatic increase in the ability of doxorubicin to kill the cells, and this was the strongest if we pretreated the cells with lapatinib. And so I think it means that this concept of dynamic network rewiring, hitting the cells with a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that's relevant to the growth factor they're addicted to, waiting for the cells to evolve, to unmask a death pathway, and then treating the cells with doxorubicin. That's the way to make these tumors regress in size. And if you look at the, the uh, Western blots that are shown in black boxes, it's only with the time-staggered approach that we actually see this cleavage of caspase 8 signifying that we've unveiled uh, the previously masked death pathway. And so what I hope I've left you with at the conclusion uh, of my talk is the idea that the EGF receptor crosstalks with the DNA damage response in a subset of triple negative breast cancer cells and non-small cell lung cancer cells and can suppress an extrinsic apoptotic pathway. And this limits the efficacy of cytotoxic chemotherapy. However, we can dynamically rewire these signaling pathways therapeutically by giving them an inhibitor of the growth factor receptor to which they are addicted. And by doing this in combination with systems biology, we can identify both biomarkers for patient selection, and again, for the triple negative breast tumors, this was those tumors that had high levels of phospho-EGFR in the basal state, and a marker for response, which in this case was cleavage, the cleavage of caspase 8. I think it's important because this shifts our focus now from having to invent new drugs to simply coming up with new ways to use old drugs. And this creates new IP for old drugs and really changes the focus to new novel approaches to drug delivery. Finally, of course, it's great to cure cancers in mice, but as I think you'll hear from my colleagues, uh, 
in the next two webinars or in the next two uh, parts of this webinar, it's really important now to try to move these types of therapies into the clinic. So I will stop here and simply acknowledge the people that did the work. I had the great fortune of working with people like Mike Lee and Stephen Morton. Uh, Mike was the postdoc that did the signaling work. Stephen was the graduate student that made the nanoparticles. And it was really a privilege to work with my colleagues, Paula Havid and Doug Laufenberger, here over at MIT. And with this, I will stop uh, and turn it back to Annalisa. OK. Well, thank you, Dr. Yaffe, for that excellent presentation. We're going to move right on to our second talk now. Our next speaker today is Dr. Jeffrey Engelman. Dr. Engelman is a principal investigator and the director of molecular therapeutics at the Massachusetts General Hospital Cancer Center and the director of thoracic oncology at Mass General. The goal of his lab's research is to advance targeted therapies to benefit patients with cancer. His research focuses on understanding sensitivity and resistance to therapies that inhibit specific kinases in cancers with specific genetic abnormalities. In particular, his laboratory focuses on the regulation of key signaling networks that control cancer cell growth and survival. In his role as the director of thoracic oncology at Massachusetts General Hospital, he directs the thoracic oncology research program, which integrates laboratory studies, clinical trials, and molecular analyses of cancers to pioneer individualized therapies. Welcome, Dr. Engelman. Uh, thank you. Um, so uh, I'm going to kind of pick off, pick up, excuse me, where, where Mike left off and discuss some of our findings in the clinic uh, as to how cancers become resistant to therapeutics. And I'm going to focus on therapeutics in lung cancer that have worked. And as Mike pointed out, they, they work and they produce great responses as shown on this cover slide, but over time these cancers become resistant. And so I'm going to speak about two different types of cancers. And one is EGFR mutant lung cancers. And this slide is just to meant as a review to point out that a subset of lung cancers, about 10%, have activating mutations in EGFR. And um, sorry, excuse me. And uh, those cancers then have great responses to EGFR kinase inhibitors. And this has basically led to overwhelmingly active uh, drug in this disease. And now these therapies are the treatment of choice for lung cancers with EGFR mutations. Another type of cancer that we know has a very is very sensitive to targeted therapies are cancers with translocations in the ALK tyrosine kinase, these cancers can be detected by a fish probe where the fish probes actually separate when there's a translocation showing positivity. This is how it's diagnosed in the clinic. And and in the clinic, it has tremendous activity. And you can see here this patient having a terrific response. And in the clinic, these kinase inhibitors are now the treatment of choice for cancers that have these abnormalities. So the problem that we're having in the clinic now is that these cancers are really sensitive to these therapies, and the, the drugs are having a tremendous effect on patients' lives. In fact, patients are living much longer now than they did before. But when we give these single-agent therapies, these cancers eventually become resistant to therapies. And what we're going to focus on in this uh, discussion is really cancers that have EGFR mutations or ALK translocations treated with EGFR inhibitors such as gefitinib or nerlotinib or ALK inhibitors such as crizotinib and try to understand how the cancer went from being very sensitive to ultimately becoming resistant. So why are the cancers sensitive to begin with? And this is a, there's a finding with these cancers that's, that's been quite consistent. And these cancers are specifically wired in a very unique way in that the EGFR mutant protein or the translocated ALK protein is basically driving the key intracellular signaling pathways that keep the cells growing and keep them alive. But they're unique in that you can use a single drug to target the tyrosine kinase, and that will lead to suppression of these pathways and lead to cell growth arrest and cell death, and that's shown here. This is a 
typical EGFR mutant cell line treated with an EGFR inhibitor, and you can see just by treating with the EGFR inhibitor, you shut off these pathways. I will point out that most cancers are not wired in such a simple way that targeting one specific tyrosine kinase will have this incredible effect in the cell where it basically suppresses multiple pathways simultaneously leading to this effect. And that is why we think these cancers are addicted to these mutant or activated receptors. So how do cancers become resistant to these therapies? Well, there's several different mechanisms of resistance, and what I wanted to do was, instead of showing you all the data to support it, was basically to kind of explain it conceptually and point out the specifics schematically. And we know they're sensitive because when you target these receptors, these pathways go are suppressed. And what we now know is that the way these cancers often become resistant is that they find a way to reactivate these critical pathways. One such way is actually mutating the receptor itself so that the drug no longer inhibits the receptor and the receptor can continue to signal. In the case of EGFR mutant cancers, there's one recurrent gatekeeper mutation that we see consistently. In ALK positive cancers, there's a, collective, there's a collection, excuse me, of mutations that can cause resistance, resistance to crizotinib, which is the ALK inhibitor first used in the clinic. We also know that there's other ways that these cancers can become resistant, and one way is that they have some rewiring upon treatment with these inhibitors where a different pathway gets activated that leads to reactivation of these downstream signaling pathways. So even though the drug inhibits the original oncogenic driver, these bypass tracks come in, activate PI3 kinase and or mech erc signaling and keep the cells alive. And in red are all the, the pathways that we know about that cause resistance or mechanisms of resistance leading to activation of these downstream signaling pathways. One early discovery was the activation of MET that can cause reactivation of these pathways, but other RTKs can do it, as well as direct mutations of PI3 kinase or MEK erc signaling directly. In addition, we have found, as shown in blue, bypass tract mechanisms that exist in ALK positive cancers causing resistance to crizotinib. A third way these cancers become resistant is that the drug still hits the target, but in these cancers, the pathways are suppressed but the cancers have now developed in a way or have adapted in a way where they no longer need those pathways to grow. And we think this is going on when we see cancers undergo remarkable EMT, epithelial to mesenchymal transitions. We see loss of key apoptotic proteins such as BIM, and we even see adenocarcinomas that go under uh, dramatic lineage changes into, into cancers such as small cell lung cancer. What we know is that we now have developed different ways of overcoming these resistance uh, mechanisms. One of the ways, of course, is to develop more potent inhibitors that can block and overcome these mutant receptors. In red are two drugs, one by Clovis and AstraZeneca, that overcome the T790M, and this leads to marked regressions in lots of patients. Others for ALK are include the drug from Novartis, LDK378, and the drug from uh, Shugai that both do the same thing. There are other ALK inhibitors that can do this well. And these drugs are having a pronounced effect in cancers that become resistant to these first-generation inhibitors. But as we're getting better at treating those cancers, what we're now seeing is that we're getting resistance shifting into these other two types of buckets. And this will really speak to the need for combinations uh, to overcome resistance. For example, in cancers that have MET amplification, you need to both inhibit the original driver, EGFR, and MET in combination to suppress these pathways and induce tumor regression. And indeed, we're starting to see this in the clinic, and these combinations are being brought forward. So as an example of what we see in the clinic, as we've been biopsying more and more patients who become resistant to these therapies, this is from a series of patients who had ALK translocated lung cancers, and you can see about a third of these cancers develop either mutation or amplification of the drug target, which may explains why they're resistant to these therapies. We can see that in several other uh, resistant cancers, they've developed bypass tracts through activation of other receptor tyrosine kinases, such as EGFR and C-kit. 
But in a large subset of these cancers, we really have no idea as to what's driving these resistant cancers. Similarly, in EGFR mutant lung cancers, we've now biopsied several cancers that have become resistant to EGFR inhibitors, and you can start to see the spectra of resistance mechanisms that can occur. About half to 60% of cancers develop that T790M mutation. We see cancers that develop the MET amplification, BRAF mutation. In many cancers, we still do not know what's causing resistance. A subset of these have undergone remarkable EMT. And we see things that we never would have predicted from preclinical models, such as EGFR mutant lung adenocarcinomas, transforming into small cell lung cancer, which is a remarkable lineage change. And these small cell lung cancers still have the EGFR mutation. They're still EGFR mutant cancers, but they've completely uh, taken on a different characteristic. One of the challenges that's become clear as we biopsied more and more patients that have become resistant to cancer is that there is heterogeneity within an individual patient as we're treating those cancers. These resistant clones, multiple different resistant clones emerge in these patients. And as we've done this more and more, it's starting to explain some clinical phenomenon. And a couple of clinical phenomena I'll point out uh, are that one is if you had an EGFR mutant lung cancer and you treated it with an EGFR inhibitor, and the patient developed T790M, which is that genetic mechanism of resistance, if the cancer was progressing on that, but then you took off the EGFR inhibitor, sometimes these patients would flare. And it was unclear why they would flare if they already have a resistant clone that's unaffected by the drug. Secondly, is that if you were able to keep that patient alive on chemotherapy and everything for a while, when you retreated them a year or two later with gefitinib or erlotinib, they would re-respond to therapy, which again made very little sense since they have a genetic mechanism of resistance such as T790M. And there's a couple of cases I wanted to point out that were very illustrative in our understanding as to what's going on. Uh, this is a, a cases that were actually uh, reported by Alicia Sequist in a sister journal, Science Translational Medicine, a few years ago. And this was a cancer patient who was biopsied multiple times along the course of their disease. This patient had EGFR mutant lung cancer, had adenocarcinoma, was sensitive to an EGFR inhibitor, was treated with erlotinib, responded beautifully, became resistant, was biopsied, and had a T790M resistance mutation. The patient then went off of the EGFR inhibitor onto chemotherapy again, and then the patient was biopsied again, and the T790M resistance mutation was no longer present, and the patient responded. So it made perfect sense as to why the patient had a re would have a re-response to therapy because the genetic mechanism of resistance was no longer present, but it was unclear why it was lost since it was genetic, basically. And then the second case was also followed with these serial biopsies. This is a patient, again, with an EGFR mutant lung cancer, responded to treatment, then became resistant. This is one of the cancers upon the development of resistance that had flipped to small cell lung cancer. This patient was then treated with chemotherapy and radiation, was biopsied again, had flipped back to adenocarcinoma, had that re-response to EGFR inhibition with erlotinib, but quickly became resistant again and had flipped back to small cell lung cancer. So what this really suggests to us is that when we're treating these patients, that we actually have different populations of cancers. And what's happening is that our different treatments are selecting for different clones. And I'm going to illustrate that here. If you pretend you have a cancer before treatment, and most of the cancer is sensitive, maybe you have a couple of pre-existing resistant clones shown in red and orange, and you treat with your EGFR inhibitor, you actually get rid of a lot of the green cells that were sensitive. Some of the green cells may actually survive. They don't die. They don't undergo apoptosis, but they are growth arrested, so they persist. There's something that Jeff Settleman called persisters. But you keep treating with your EGFR inhibitor, and the red and the orange clones really grow out, and you get full resistance. You biopsy, and you see your T790M mutation. However, when you now take off the EGFR inhibitor, and you take off the EGFR inhibitor, excuse me, 
you would get a flare because you get a re-expansion of the green cells that were kept in check by the EGFR inhibitor, and now they can regrow out. And that's why you might get this flare of a resistant cancer when you take them off of the drug. Now if you biopsy these cancers, you may find that you don't see the T790M mutation because it's a more rare, allele, more rare allele in this tumor mass, and depending on the technologies you use, you may not see it. However, if you treat this cancer again, you may get another response because the, you've had development, oh, excuse me, sorry, click one too many. You may get a re-response because you've developed these green cells that are actually quite sensitive to the drug and that you can now treat with a lot and then you get another response. However, that second response is never as good as the first response, probably because you've built up this healthy reserve of resistant cells. So what we're seeing is multiple populations in the patient and what clone grows out may really depend on the selective pressure that is applied. So when we start to think about patients, and what they have, instead of saying a patient has T790M resistance or has MET amplification, each patient may have their own pie chart in terms of the distribution of resistant clones in that patient. And what we don't know is truly what the heterogeneity is that exists in patients. Some patients may have a ton of dis different resistant clones, and it may be quite a large group of resistant cells, whereas some other cancers may be quite homogeneous in their development of resistance and may just have one color. We know, also know in some resistant cancers, we may not be fully suppressing the target, and that's why the cancers are becoming resistant, because we don't fully shut it down. This is particularly true in the case of ALK, where we know that if we put these patients on a more potent ALK inhibitor, such as seritinib, which can overcome ALK mutations, but is also more potent against ALK, when we put patients who progress on crizotinib on this drug, almost every patient uh, responds to therapy. Even patients that don't develop ALK mutations as their resistance mechanism to crizotinib. So this is working on patients who have ALK positive cancers, became resistant to crizotinib, but hadn't even developed ALK mutations. So we suspect that this is because many of these cancers that became resistant, that didn't have ALK mutations, were resistant partly because of incomplete inhibition of ALK. And what we know is as we treat with these newer generation ALK inhibitors, we start to select for different resistant clones, such as this case where we treated this patient with crizotinib. They became resistant. They developed a mutation, this S1206Y mutation. This S1206Y mutation is actually very sensitive to the newer generation ALK inhibitor. The patient was put on that drug. The patient then responded to that drug, became resistant, and developed a new mutation, this G1202R mutation. And this G1202R mutation is actually very resistant to the newer drug. So what we're seeing is as we put patients on these newer drugs, we're seeing the development of different resistant clones, such as G1202R and F1174, that are resistant to these new clones. And we know as we've done biopsies, uh, I'm sorry, as we've done autopsies, on these patients, we've looked in different sites of metastases, and we can see different resistance mechanisms at different sites of metastases. So this heterogeneity clearly exists in our patients. And what we know now is that what we're doing in the clinic is not working. Basically, what we're doing is we're treating with one treatment until the cancer becomes resistant. We're then biopsying them at this point, hoping to overcome resistance here where we have a significant amount of heterogeneity and it's going to be significantly harder to overcome resistance at this point. What we're imagining is that what we need to do is start biopsying patients at this point, and when the patients get to this minimal residual disease state, we actually may want to change therapies to overcome the resistant clones that are developing in a proactive manner rather than being reactive when the cancer has become fully resistant so we're imagining that we might develop more complex types of strategies that would require multiple different types of combinations used proactively to snuff out resistance before it even becomes clinically overt. And so finally, in conclusion, I would just like to reiterate a couple of the major points, if this slide will ever advance. 
is that we think that resistance to the current generation of tyrosine kinase inhibitors limits their clinical impact. We know that resistance to these drugs can be mediated by mutation of the gene target or activation of the bypass tract that can reactivate these downstream pathways. We know that multiple resistant clones can coexist in a single patient, and we believe that future treatment regimens may require complex combinations to overcome resistance. Uh, so with that, I will uh, thank you for your attention and uh, hand, the back, hand the mic back over to the moderator. Okay, great, Dr. Engelman. Thank you so much for your presentation. Our third and final speaker today is Dr. Michael Deininger. Dr. Deininger is a professor and chief of hematology and hematologic malignancies in the Department of Internal Medicine and the Huntsman Cancer Institute at the University of Utah. He also serves as senior director of transdisciplinary research at the Huntsman Cancer Institute. He has extensive experience treating patients with blood cancers and has a particular interest in chronic myeloid leukemia and myoproliferative neoplasms, which are blood cancers related to leukemia. As a clinician scientist with a translational research focus, Dr. Deininger heads a research laboratory that's dedicated to the study of signaling pathways, drug resistance, and new molecular therapies in leukemia. Dr. Deininger, welcome. You have the floor. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I think from very complex, we go back to a little simpler, uh, back to a disease called chronic myeloid leukemia. But as a first introduction, I'd like to point out that tyrosine kinases and, in fact, protein kinases are critical regulators of a number of signaling pathways that are critical to cellular physiology. I was thinking that there are about uh, 518 uh, tyrosine, uh, protein kinases in the genome and uh, 90 of those are tyrosine kinases. The, about a third of those are non-receptor tyrosine kinases. Most of these tyrosine kinases have been involved in cancer in one or the other way. The disease I'm going to talk uh, about is called chronic myeloid leukemia. This is a myeloproliferative neoplasm that typically starts in a chronic phase but if it's not effectively treated, it advances to uh, what we call blast phase, which is really an acute leukemia that is extremely difficult to treat and typically fatal within a few weeks or months. CML was uh, the first uh, cancer associated with a consistent chromosomal abnormality called the Philadelphia chromosome. Uh, that was in 1960, but over the years or even decades, people figured out what happens as a result of this uh, chromosomal translocation that juxtaposes uh, two genes that are not normally related in the genome. It's the ABLE gene that normally resides on chromosome 9 and the BCR gene that normally resides on chromosome 22. And as a, a result of this translocation event, there is a fusion gene formed on what we call the Philadelphia chromosome which is called bcr And bcr it turns out, is a very active tyrosine kinase. That's shown on the next slide, if it comes. OK, sorry. OK, there, there it is. So if you, if you take bcr and express it in a, in a cell line, that's shown on the left here, 32D cells, and you plot these cells for tyrosine phosphorylated proteins, you see this very dramatic increase of phosphotyrosine. So that's an indication that a number of signaling pathways are very profoundly disturbed by the presence of this active tyrosine kinase. If you shut down the, the kinase activity with a small molecule inhibitor like uh, imatinib, or also called Clevec, you see this reduction of cellular phosphotyrosine. And this is associated with the reduction of cell growth. So it's just like the previous speakers uh, very elegantly uh, mentioned already, if you inhibit critical signaling pathways in these cancer cells, you can inhibit their growth and, in, in fact, induce apoptosis. Now, uh, unlike in... Uh, lung cancer, the advent of imatinib has made a, a very dramatic dent in the overall survival 
of patients with CML because it turns out that quite a few of the responses we see on tyrosine kinase inhibitors are fairly stable. This is data uh, from MD Anderson where you see the survival of patients based on the uh, uh, based on the decade that they were referred to MD Anderson. And you see very clearly that the advent of imatinib in the uh, early 2000s made a very dramatic difference. Now, most patients with CML nowadays are actually likely to do relatively well. However, there is a subset of patients who will eventually have a relapse of their disease on tyrosine kinase inhibitors like imatinib that we refer to as first-generation drugs. And so over time, the field has developed several additional inhibitors to combat resistance to imatinib. And that's shown on this, on this slide. So there are some inhibitors like bosutinib and desatinib that target the ABL kinase or BCR ABL kinase, but also inhibit SARC family kinases. Then there are the more specific inhibitors like imatinib and mylotinib that are more res restricted in their activity spectrum and target ABL together with a relatively small subset of other kinases. And then there are drugs like ponatinib shown on the, on, on the right here that inhibit certain mutations that confer resistance to imatinib and the second generation drugs. And these in inhibitors typically have uh, a wider activity spectrum. So let's uh, uh, just briefly recapitulate how these tyrosine kinases are structured. So you typically have in fact, in all protein kinases, uh, an N-terminal lobe that is made predominantly of beta sheets. And then you have a C-terminal lobe that consists of alpha helices. And there right in the middle, I hope you can see that, see a bit of a cursor, um, there is the uh, catalytic cleft where all the critical residues uh, reside that are required to transfer phosphate residues to tyrosins on protein. So um, if you uh, have your kinase in inactive conformation, this activation loop here is flipped back over the catalytic center and prevents productive engagement of ATP and substrate. And so if you look at the various inhibitors that have been synthesized, we distinguish type 2 inhibitors that bind in inactive conformation and are typically quite specific versus type 1 inhibitors that bind to an active conformation are less specific and have a broader uh, tyrosine kinase activity spectrum. If resistance develops, then the key question that uh, you always need to answer is whether this resistance is due to reactivation of the initial transforming principle in CML, this is bcr able or whether you have a bcr able independent mechanism. So on the, on the left here, uh, you see that in this case of lymphoid blast crisis, the um, drugs used, imatinib and desatinib, are unable to suppress tyrosine phosphorylation, and that's uh, measured here by the substrate phosphorylation of crackle, which is a specific substrate of PCRA. So that would be consistent with reactivation of the original transforming kinase. On the other hand, here on the right hand, on, on the right side, you see uh, another case where the cerebral activity remains suppressed, and yet this patient had developed clinical resistance. So this is uh, basically circumventing the activity of the inhibitor, and I think would indicate that there is a rewiring of the system to use another transforming event to maintain cell viability and growth. So. Uh, the field has been very interested in understanding the resistance due to tyrosine kinase mutations. And it turns out that the mutations really tend to occur in a fairly limited number of residues, typically lining here the catalytic cleft. The inhibitors that have now been approved for treatment of CML are distinct in their activity spectrum against various tyrosine kinases. And that's shown here in this um, heat map. So uh, green means responsive, yellow means somewhat resistant, and red means totally resistant. So you can look at this activity spectrum and then 
based on the patient's genotype, pick the inhibitor that is most likely to work in a given case. You see also that there is one mutation here um, called T359 that confers resistance to most available inhibitors, imatinib, milotinib, bisatinib, and bisutinib, and is targeted currently only by ponatinib. I've got a drug here that is called rebastinib that unfortunately failed in phase one, two trials because of toxicity. So in other words, we can use the genotype to make informed clinical decisions, but there are some uh, mutations that confer resistance to practically all, in, in, in this case, all but one of the available inhibitors. So our lab has been interested in the problem of this T359 mutation for quite a while. And we've uh, had identified several molecules to inhibit T359 that unfortunately all failed because of toxicity problems. But in collaboration with our Ariad Pharmaceuticals, we were finally able to identify a molecule now called ponatinib that circumvents resistance based on T59. This is shown here in this uh, structural analysis. This is the T315 residue, and if you substitute threonine with isolysin, you get this very bulky residue here that's basically sticking out. So imatinib, which needs to contact hydrophobic pocket on the backside of T315, and also make a hydrogen bond with threonine T315, is unable to bind because it's pushed out because of, as a result of steric hindrance. On the other hand, Ponatinib, which has a very rigid uh, triple CC bond here, is able to avoid T359 completely and uses other binding sites within the kinase to inhibit, uh, well, to basically lock down the, uh, the enzymatic activity. The one uh, essay that we developed a few years ago, which is actually quite simple but helpful to predict clinical mutations, is the expression of uh, a mutant cell line, a BCR-able expressing cell line, mutagenizing this line with uh, an alkylating agent, agent called ENU, and then using uh, these mutagenized cells in 96 well plates in the presence of an inhibitor to allow them to grow out um, single clones with resistance. So typically, you'll find a few clones that grow despite the presence of drug. You can then further characterize these clones by means like, such as DNA uh, sequencing to see whether you have a mutation in the target kinase. Now, using this assay in the context of onapsinib, that's shown on the next slide, Here we are. If you use this assay with ponatinib in the context of native bcr able so without a mutation present at the beginning, you see that outgrowth of mutant clones is completely suppressed if you ramp up the concentration of ponatinib to 40 nanomoles. However, if you do the same experiment with the T39 mutation that is sensitive to ponatinib, you see that resistant clones grow out up to much higher concentrations, in fact, up to 320 nanomoles. And it turns out that if you do sequencing of these, mutant, uh, of these resistant clones, they have acquired an additional mutation in the same molecule in bcr And we call that a compound mutation. But a compound mutation, unlike polyclonal mutations, is a mutation that happens in this, is basically two mutations happening in the same BCR molecule. Now, interestingly, you see that this E255V mutation is the mutation that has the relatively greatest resistance to ponatinib itself. So the combination of T359 plus e 255 gives you a great deal of resistance to ponatinib. Now, um, if you look at the clinical results with ponatinib, it turns out that responses in chronic phase are fairly durable and are actually achieved in the majority of patients that's shown on the, on the left here. 
So once you have a cytogenetic response, you're quite likely to maintain that. If you look at patients with accelerated phase, which is somewhat more advanced, the results are already looking much less favorable. So we look at major hematologic response here, and you see that by and large, these responses are only transient. If you look at uh, the even more advanced phases of the disease, last phase CML, or for the same uh, matter, BH positive ALL, you will see that hardly any one of these responses is maintained over time. And interestingly, here in BH positive ALL, you see that those patients with T59 mutation at baseline do particularly badly compared to other patients. So we were able to do uh, correlative studies uh, based on this large phase two trial. And we found that in about 50% or so of patients, we see a persistence or a reactivation rather of B cerebral signaling. In most cases, this is due to compound mutations in the tyrosine and in the target kinase. In another 50% of patients, there is apparently rewiring uh, of the transforming principle, and we are actively investigating this resistance mechanism, but as yet have not been able to identify a consistent mechanism. So in terms of the compound mutations, there are a couple of, uh, I think, interesting observations to be made in CML that may be applicable to other cancers as well. First of all, uh, compound mutations are really composed of doublets of a relatively restricted set of resistance mutations. So in the case of CML, it's a total of 10 mutations that are recurrent, and all the compounds we found at uh, high allelic uh, representation are made of combinations of two of these base mutations. If you then look at the sensitivity profiles of compound mutations, it turns out that mutations that have no participation of T259, that is the mutation that confers resistance to all TKIs but ponatinib, uh, demonstrate a, a variety of sensitivities. For example, if you look here at ponatinib, you'll see some of these mutations still responsive to ponatinib. Some other mutations may still be responsive to nilotomy. So, in other words, here I think the uh, in vitro profiling, together with a genotype, allows you again to make some uh, um, rational clinical decisions. However, if a mutation has participation of T59, it does confer resistance to literally all the currently available inhibitors. So, unfortunately, for these patients at this uh, moment there is no good targeted therapy available, and we would typically refer them for a bone marrow transplant. This is just to give you an example. This is a patient with pH positive ALL, and if you look at this clone here that is not detectable by conventional sequencing, we did that by uh, subcloning uh, in, in retrospect, you have uh, a small subclone of T59 plus E255B. And unfortunately, that subclone grew out very rapidly after only four weeks and led to a very rapid relapse of the transient response. Now, if you do um, computational modeling, you can actually rationalize why these compound mutations do not respond to ponatinib anymore. It's very hindrance, it's very clash with uh, the altered kinase, altered as, re as a result of the two mutations pattern. Now, one critical question that will arise here that I cannot answer at this point is whether the compound mutations that have participations of T59 have some communalities in their structure that would make them amenable to another TKI still binding to the ATP binding site. We are actively researching that at the moment, but I don't have the answer yet. However, another potential strategy, if I can get the slide. Oh, let, let, let me, let, let me um, just get one, uh, add one more additional principle. Uh, if you look at a kinase um, that is optimized by nature, if you will, and you, you introduce additional mutations, starting with 
case of table T69, and then you add compound mutations. You can ask, when is that going to be t detrimental to the kinase activity and may eventually lead to self-disabling of the kinase? One uh, avenue at getting that is to run biochemical assays to look at kinase activity. Another avenue, and we've done that to some extent, another avenue is to ask in patient samples the question whether mutations that are acquired are more likely to be silent mutations if it's getting too many, and that's shown here. So these are CML patients with resistance to TKIs. We subclone these uh, PCR products, and we just ask a simple question, do you get more silent mutations uh, as a result in, in, in concordance with the total number of mutations acquired? In other words, if the mutation is detrimental, if, 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 if a non-silent mutation is detrimental, then that clone would be eliminated. On the other hand, if it's a silent mutation, this would be biologically neutral. And in fact, this is exactly what you find. So if you look over here from one to five, you see that the uh, representation of silent mutations within that total mutation uh, number increases. So we can conclude from this observation that the more mutation the clone acquires, the kinase acquires, the less functional it will be. And I do think, think that that opens up some, uh, at least, speculations that eventually these kinase may mutate themselves to death with uh, uh, better kinase activities that drives them into acquisition of multiple mutations. Now back to the problem of compound mutations. So uh, most of the tyrosine kinase inhibitors that have been uh, synthesized to date target the ATP binding site. However, kinases do have other regulatory elements as well. And we call inhibitors that bind to these regulatory elements allosteric inhibitors. Now, in the case of ABLE, there is a pocket here at the bottom of the kinase that binds myrstate. And myrstate is uh, a, it's a, a lipid linked to the ABLE end terminal. And in the uh, inactive conformation of ABLE, this end terminal mediated by Myrstate basically sticks into this pocket of the kinase uh, domain and locks the kinase in an inactive conformation. So can we use that therapeutically? The answer is probably yes. This work is not yet prime time, but uh, some people in the field, in this case Novartis, has made inhibitors that specifically target the Myrstate binding pocket in an attempt to basically recapitulate this auto-inhibition of the kinase that we see in our resting cells. One of these compounds is called GNF2, and another one is called GNF5, and a clinical inhibitor is called ABLE1, uh, ABLE but the um, structure of this compound is not yet publicly available. So if you use these drugs, um, I'll just get to the next slide. Okay, so if you use these drugs in comparison with uh, nilotinib in this case, which is a second generation inhibitor in cells expressing T69, you see that on their own they are relatively inactive. So this is GNF5, it has some activity. This is nilotinib, it has uh, even less activity. But if you combine the two inhibitors, you see a pretty dramatic reduction of cell growth and also apoptosis induction. Here on the right, we look at B-serial phosphorylation, and again, this is basically baseline nilotinib, and then you add in uh, uh, graded concentrations of the GNF compound. And you see that you do see suppression of uh, tyrosine kinase activity, despite the presence of uh, the T69 mutant, but it requires the presence of both drugs at the same time. Conversely, if you make a mutation in the uh, mirror state binding pocket that pushes out GNF, you see that this confers resistance and so tyrosine phosphorylation or tyrosine kinase activity is maintained over here. So rather than a summary, um, I uh, want to really acknowledge the people who did the work 
This is uh, Dr. O'Hare, who co head for Lab with me. This is Anna Eyring, a very talented postdoc, and uh, Ira Kraft, who did some of the work, and Mike Tobrisky, who did much of the mutation work. And with that, I thank you for your attention. All right. Thank you, Dr. Deininger. And also, I'd like to say thank you to Dr. Engelman and Dr. Yaffe for these very engaging presentations. Unfortunately, we're running out of time. I think technically we've already run out of time, but we've gotten a lot of questions in from the viewers. And so I'd like to ask just a couple of questions quickly. Um, the first one I'll, I'll direct to Dr. Yaffe. Several viewers have asked about the development of resistance following your combination therapy. Have you looked at tumors that were treated with the receptor tyrosine kinase inhibitors followed by the DNA damaging agent over the long term? I mean, do you have any evidence that the time-staggered combination therapy causes less drug resistance ultimately, or do you expect those tumors to eventually develop resistance to the combination therapy? Um, we have not. It's an excellent question. We have not yet looked, uh, although we're in the process of doing that. Um, we decided to focus the resistance studies on autochthonous tumors rather than on xenografts in nude mice. And so uh, we've been in the process of breeding and developing those tumor models. Um, I think that what we will see eventually will be some resistance, although I think it will be partially reduced because we've reduced the overall population of tumor cells that can then emerge as resistant clones. And I think that the key is going to be basically, as, as um, Jeff and Michael said, to figure out when we get resistant clones, what's the mechanism of the resistance, and can we get at that, again, by doing a time-staggered approach with an, with a, an alternative drug. I think the other way around this, though, <clears throat> as was very nicely illustrated, is to have holidays in which we use comp in which we use growth factor targeting followed by chemotherapy <clears throat> and then periods of just chemotherapy in the absence of growth factor targeting followed by re engagement of the growth factor receptor and by doing that i think we'll prevent or at least delay the development of resistant clones back to you annalisa all right um so the next question i want to ask um i kind of i would like to throw out to all three panelists um that all of you have mostly been talking about growth factor signaling pathways or pathways that directly control cancer cell proliferation or survival. What about metabolic pathways? Um, do you think that you could that one could develop combination or time stagger therapies that exploit the metabolic re rewiring that's present in a lot of cancer cells? Well, I I. I... I might take the question. I, I think there's, there's good evidence in, in, in AML with activating mutations of um, IDH2 that um, these uh, events that you know lead to metabolic reprogramming can happen very early in disease evolution. So I think this is a, a very promising field. The way I would look at that is that it needs to be eventually it will have to combine with other signaling pathway inhibitors because as uh, the other speakers pointed out very um, elegantly, there is hardly any uh, cancer that is not complex from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And so you'll have polyclonal polyclonality, and it would be surprising if resistance didn't develop to these agents as well. Okay. Yeah, this well. is... This is Jeff. I would I would just echo that. I think it's a great question, um, and I think we're very curious about uh, how these drugs, how the cells that survive these drugs, uh, not only if you could target them with metabolic uh, by inhibiting metabolic proteins, but also epigenetic proteins, because we think uh, epigenetic regulators. Excuse me, because we think that the cells that survive initial therapy uh, actually are a bit more mesenchymal, they're in different epigenetic states, they may have different metabolic wiring, and they may be susceptible to agents that target those uh, kind of specific uh, pathways that, that maintain those states. Uh, in my own lab, I haven't really done much research, though, to, to demonstrate that that's actually the case or identify exciting targets in, in those spaces. Uh, this is Mike Yaffe. I just want to sort of echo exactly what Michael and Jeff um, 
have already said, um, but add a little bit of a system spin to it. So one thing that's beginning to emerge, it's very early days for this, we're doing some in our lab, and I know other labs have done some as well, is the finding that in response to conventional genotoxic DNA damaging chemotherapy, there is a reprioritization of metabolic targets, um, many of which seem to be involved in targeting uh, pathways involved in purine and pyrimidine biosynthesis, as one might expect since it's necessary now to repair the DNA. And so it may be that specific metabolic inhibitors that target pathways that are required for resistance to genetically uh, genotoxic stress might be an interesting type of combination to explore. We have not done this yet, but it is certainly something on our wish list. Okay. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time for, the, for our webinar. I'd like to sincerely thank Dr. Yaffe from MIT, Dr. Engelman from Harvard Medical School, and Dr. Deininger from the University of Utah for being with us today and for their interesting talks and discussion. I'd also like to thank our online audience for the questions you submitted. There were a lot of questions, and we didn't have time to get through through even a small portion of them, um, but, we, but, we appreciate, but we appreciate you sending in your questions. So please go to the URL now at the bottom of your slide at the bottom of your slide viewer to learn more about resources that are related to, to today's discussion and look out for more webinars from science available at webinar.sciencemag.org. This webinar will, will be made available to view again as an on-demand presentation within about 48 hours from now. And we'd love to hear what you thought of the webinar. You can send us an email to the address that's, that should be that's shown on your slide viewer right now, webinar at sciencemag.org. Again, thank you to our panelists, and thank you to Cell Signaling Technologies and the Koch Institute for their kind sponsorship of today's seminar. Goodbye. <laughs>